Dear students, Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you to the 11th program on Software Engineering 1 course. We have been discussing different models that are prepared during the analysis phase. In the last two programs, we discussed data modeling and process or functional modeling. We explained that ER diagram is a very useful tool to model data and DFDs are commonly used for process modeling. As we mentioned in the previous program, that a software system must respond to the external as well as to internal events. Therefore, the software engineer needs to examine how a software should behave or respond to various events. This is particularly important for real-time systems because the real-time systems are often driven by stimuli from the system's environment. Today, we are going to discuss the behavior modeling and state transition diagrams. We'll introduce the notion of a data dictionary as a supplement to system models. Most software respond to events from the outside world. So it is a very important thing that a system engineer and the software engineer must understand that how the system is going to behave. Understanding the behavior of the system is as important as understanding the data and the processing requirement of a system. Ideally, a system responds to the outside world events. We have an application, this software, which receives different events from the outside world. In response to the events, the software or the system behaves in a predictable manner. Now, it is very important to note that the behavior of the system must be predictable. This is the requirement of building a correct and high quality software. The events which are received by the software may be generated by the process itself. An occurrence of an event causes the system to exhibit some predictable form of behavior. For example, the printer might be in the idle state or the wait state when it is not printing. Then in response to some event, the printer starts printing. It changes its state from the idle state to the printing state. The event which caused that change is the submission of a new print job to the printer. The same applies to your car. It is in the stationary state, in response to an event or a series of events, it starts running. So it changes state from the stationary to the running state. Therefore, a software engineer must understand that how the software will react to the external as well as internal events. Now, it's also very important that before we discuss how the how the behavior modeling is done, we should be familiar with the terminology related to the behavior model. The terms we'll be using are a state. In the behavior modeling, a state is a set of observable circumstances that characterizes the behavior of a system at a given time. A state transition the movement from one state to another state. As I gave you the example, the printer was in the state of idle. In response to some event, it changes its state to the printing. So the change of the state is called the state transition. Then event, an event is an occurrence that causes the system to exhibit some predictable form of behavior. Again, in our example of the printer, the event which made the printer to change its state was the submission of a new print job. 
than the action. Action is the process that occurs as a consequence of making a transition. That means that when an event happens and it is recognized by the system, when the system is changing the state, it also performs some action. Dear students, we use state transition diagrams to model system behavior. As we did use the, as we use the ER diagrams to model the data and DFDs to model the process. In a similar way, the state transition diagrams are used to model the behavior of a system. A state transition diagram is a very simple tool that can capture the events, action that are to be taken in response to various events and various system states and the transitions. Now, to make a correct state transition diagram, we have to be familiar with the notations which are used in making these diagrams. Again, unfortunately, there are there is no standard notations available to us. Different people use different notations to represent the state and the transition, the actions. But notation we are going to use are shown here. We will use a rectangle for a state, and the name of the state will be written inside the rectangle. An arrow shows the change of the state or the transition. So system goes from this state to the new state. Now event causing the transition is written on the top of a horizontal line. And the action which is taken by the software is written under that line. So these are very simple notations which are used in making the state transition diagram. Now the question is, how can we proceed with preparing a state transition diagram? Dear students, there is a very simple procedure to do that. You just have to follow some simple steps to make a correct and complete state transition diagram. The steps that are generally followed are, first, you should make a list of different states of a system. No, you cannot make that list of different states unless you have a good understanding of the system. So have a good understanding of the system, then find out the what state the system could be. Then you should indicate how the system makes a transition from one state to another state. What makes a system to change the state? Then what are the events which the system should respond to? And you should note one important thing here. We are not interested in all and every event that happens in the environment of a system. We should be interested in capturing only those events to which our system should respond, and the rest of the events should be simply ignored. And we should indicate the action the system should take in response to different events. Once we have all that information available to us, then we can draw a state transition diagram. So what's important in making a state transition diagram is a good understanding of the system again. Because these models only help you to understand the system in a much, much better way. The modeling cannot be done unless you have a good understanding of the system. Now let's have a look at an example of a state transition diagram for a photocopier machine. We have identified that the photocopier machine can be in one of these four states. The reading command state, making copy state, diagnosing problem state, and the reloading paper state. We have already identified the events and the action which should be taken at each state. Initially, the system is in the idle state. 
and the action which is taken is invoke read operation input. If we assume that this photocopy machine is being controlled by a software, then you can think that a process is running in the background which is waiting for the user input, that what he wants to do. And as long as no input is provided by the user, the system remains in the same state, which is the reading command state. Once this event happens, which is full and start, which simply means that there is a paper in the photocopier and the user presses the start button of the photocopier machine, then this is the action which is taken by the machine, which is invoke managing copying. So again, think that this is a software module which starts making the copies of the paper. And the system changes the state and goes from reading command state to the making copying state, which is a logical transition. So as long as the system remains in the making copying state, then you can see here the three different events can happen. The first event is the copying is done. The second event which can happen here is the photocopier machine is empty, there is, no, there is no paper, or the paper is jammed. So at each state, what is important to note here that we have to see which events can happen and what action should be taken in response to each event. For example, if the copying is done, then invoke read operation input is done and the system goes back to the reading command. And again, it waits for a user command. If there is no paper, then we invoke the reload paper. You might simply get a message on the small screen of your photocopier telling you there is no more paper or the reload paper, whatever message could be there. So once we receive that message, then the system goes into the reloading paper. At the reloading paper state, only one event can happen. And that is you have to put more paper into the photocopier. Once you put the paper into the copier and it is full, then we again go back to the reading command state. And now the user can again press the start and can, st can start making the copies again. Now if the photocopier is jammed, then we invoke the perform problem diagnosis. Now that might simply display that the paper is jammed and many of the photocopier also give you the indication that where the paper is jammed. So that is the action. So action could be a simple a message to the user and the system goes into the diagnosing problem mode or the state. Once the paper has been taken out of the photocopier and there is no jam, then again we go back to the reading command state and the user can again start making the photocopying. Now, that diagram clearly shows that how the system should, should behave at each and every state. While you are making a, a state transition diagram for your software, you should be doing the similar type of thing you should really see that what are the possible states in which your system could be, and on each states, which events can happen, and what action your software should take in response to those events. Now, dear students, as we see in this diagram, that the state transition diagrams are supplemented with the control specification and the data flow diagrams are supplemented by process specification RP spec and the entity relationship diagrams are supplemented by data object description. That simply means once you are making the state transition diagram, the diagram doesn't give all the information. You should write a control specification and generally the specification is written in a nature language or in some formal way. It might be just an if-then-else 
type of thing that if the paper is jammed, do this thing, and if the paper is not jammed, do that thing. So the control specification basically gives the logic of the process, that how different, how the system behaves to different events. In a similar way, the process specification gives the detail of each and every process which we identified in while making the DFDs. The contents of the process specification can include narrative text, a program design language, or a PDL, description of the process algorithm, a mathematical equations, tables, diagrams, or charts can be used. There are many techniques to write the process specification as well as the control specification. Most commonly used, of course, people write the algorithms, or we use the flowcharts, or, uh, or we use the decision tables or the decision trees to show the logic of each process. So while you are making these models, you should always be supplementing those models with their specifications. So providing the P specification and the C specification, the process specification and the control specification for each bubble and for each state in your state transition diagram is very important. The software engineer must create a mini spec that can serve as a first step in the creation of the software requirement specification and as a guide for design of the program components that will implement the process and the control in your system. Dear student, it's very important that while you are writing the specification, you should be using a very clear language because this is the process specification and these models which become the basis for the design of your software and ultimately the implementation and development of the software. So you have to be very careful in doing the modeling and writing the specification of your system. Dear students, the analysis models encompass representation of data objects, functions, and control as we discussed. In each representation, data objects and control items play a very important role. Therefore, it is necessary to provide an organized approach for representing the characteristics of each data object and control item because the description of data objects and the control item is not mentioned on the diagrams and it has to be documented separately. The data dictionary provides you a tool which can be used to uh, document all the objects and the control information in much more detail. The data dictionary has been proposed as a quasi formal grammar for describing the con contents of objects defined during structured analysis. Although the format of dictionaries vary from tool to tool, as has been the case with all our modeling techniques and tools. But most of the dictionaries contain the following information. The name, which is the primary name of the data or the control item, the data store, or an external entity. Alias, the other names which are used for the same name where used and how is used. How that data item or the control item or a data store is used and where it is used, it has to be mentioned very clearly in the data dictionary. We should also provide the content description, which is a notation for representing the contents of a data item. And some supplementary information can also be provided in the data dictionary. The supplementary information may include the data types, preset values if known, restriction or limitations on the values. So some 
special notations are used to develop the content description of each data item. The notation which are commonly used are the equal sign, which means is composed of. The plus sign means and, and a vertical bar means either or. And written on the top of the curly bracket means the end repetition of that data object. Something which is written in the small bracket it means this is the optional data. And the comments are written inside the inside stars. So these are the common notations, which are basically used to make the entries in your data dictionary. Now data dictionary is very, very important because it provides you all the information related to whole of your system one can always refer to the data dictionary to know the description of each and every data item which flows into your system and each and every control information which your system requires or responds to. Let's see one of the example of a data dictionary entry. That's one example of data dictionary entry which has been written for the telephone number which is an input to a process. So that you can think it's a part of a DFD. So every data item and data store and control which is mentioned on the DFD or the state transition diagram must be documented in your data dictionary. So in our example, we have the telephone number and we have to make an entry for that data item. So name names the telephone number other names which are used for the same data item. Some people might call it only the phone number and some people simply call it number. So that minimizes the confusion that three different words can be used to mean the same thing. How and where that data item is used. It is used read phone number as an input. So this is the process and the telephone number is an input to that process. Then display phone number is another process of your one of your DFD. And again, that process takes the telephone number and produces the output. So the telephone number is also used by that process as an output. Another process which is using the telephone number is analyze long distance call, for example. And this process also takes that data item as an input. So you have to mention here all the processes which take that telephone number, that data item as an input or an output, or if it is stored in your data storage. Then we must provide a description of the telephone number. So it says telephone number is the telephone number comprises of local extension or an outside number or a zero. Then outside number is defined as it can be nine plus the service code and the domestic number. Then the service code is written like that. So these entries are the optional. You have to select one of them from here and the domestic number is made like that. And the area code, we have written a comment there that it is a three numerical designator. And the format is that number should be an alpha numeric data. So you can see here that lot of detail has been given about each and every data item or the control item of your system. Dear students, in today's program, we explain the behavioral modeling and how state transition diagrams are used for behavior modeling of a system. We introduce the notion of a data dictionary as a supplement to system models and typical information that is recorded in a system dictionary. 
Dear students, with this, we come to the conclusion of the analysis and the analysis modeling. In the next program, we'll be doing a complete case study in which we'll take a scenario of a system and we'll develop different models of that system to give you a better understanding that how these models are really developed for real, real life applications. Till the next program, Allah Hafiz.